How does Docker work on a lower level? Before we get a closer look at how containerization and implicitly Docker work, let's make sure that we understand how virtualization or virtual machines work. This is best understood with an example. Let's imagine we have a process, some piece of code which is running on a normal computer with a normal operating system. Nothing complex or fancy. From the point of view of the process, the operating system has one crucial obligation which it has to fulfill in order for our process to be able to do its thing, namely system calls. In case you don't know what system calls are, let's cover them quickly, again with an example. Let's say our process is trying to read from a file on the hard disk of the machine. In all modern operating systems, the process will not be allowed to open any file it wants and do with them whatever it may like. You can imagine how this might be a huge security risk. If you try opening files directly from a process in the context of a modern operating system, and by modern I mean basically any operating system which came after DOS, the OS will not take such blatant lack of manners kindly at all, and will promptly and mercilessly kill our process. Instead, if our process wants to access a certain file, it has to act more humbly and go through the sophisticated protocol of system calls imposed by the OS. The process will kindly ask the OS, can you please open this file for me and allow me to read its contents? At this point, the operating system will pause the process and go ahead and check if it is allowed to access that file in the first place. If the process has the right level of clearance for the file, the OS will then gladly open the file, offer the process the right information necessary to read from the file, then resume the process. Now, this protocol of system calls doesn't only apply to files. It applies to any situation in which a process needs access to hardware. Sync memory, display, external devices, networking, graphical processing units, printers, and the list goes on. Whenever you need to access hardware, which means more or less whenever you are doing anything besides math and logic, you have to initiate a system call. Now, let's go back and take a look at virtualization, or process no longer runs directly on our operating system. It runs on another operating system, which is virtual. It is simulated. Let's see how this plays out. Once again, our process is running, doing great things. We have done some important calculation and need to save our progress in a file. So the process being mannered and following the relevant protocol initiates a system call to open a certain file. In this situation, the following will take place. The operating system doesn't jump in, as usual, but rather our virtualization software, also called our hypervisor, notices the system call and springs into action. It then translates the virtual system call to a real system call. Let's exemplify. The VM might think it has a hard disk, like most computers do, but, Actually, instead of being an actual physical hard disk, it is just a file on the hard disk of the host operating system. So when our process thinks it is trying to open a file, it is just trying to access a chunk of the larger file, living somewhere on the guest operating system, which it thinks it is a hard disk. This goes similarly to all other hardware the VM might need. For example, the display of the VM is just a window on your desktop on the host OS, like any other process which needs a window, say a web browser or a text editor. Or the network interface of the VM is a simulated link, which may or may not point to the actual physical network interface of the hardware device on which the VM is running. It might also just exist to form connections between VMs running on the same machine. Now that we understand how virtualization works, 
we can see what the main advantages of virtualization are. Virtualization also provides an abstraction and isolation layer. What happens in a VM stays in a VM. That's why VMs are a popular way for trying out software which originates from a shady source, for a lack of, of a better term, which might turn out to be malicious. In case the VM gets infected, just delete it. It is off, it's just a file on the hard disk of the host, and if it's running, it's just a process, so killing it is easy. This way, the harm done is greatly limited. Also, as VMs are just files, they can be easily transported from one physical machine to another. VMs make many production operation tasks a lot easier. For example, managing dependency versions, running legacy software, or running multiple instances of a certain service. As VMs can also interact with each other, it can also be used as a way for segregating each software service necessary for a certain enterprise, so that each component is easier to maintain while the entire system still works just as expected. Okay, that was virtualization. Now, let's take a look at containerization. The idea of containerization started becoming popular with the introduction of namespaces in the Linux kernel. Basically, what namespaces allow you to do is partition your hardware resources into multiple, well, namespaces. You can then assign certain processes to those namespaces and they will only be able to use the resources in that partition. And they will not be able to see processes from other partitions. They just live in their small confined world and work with what they have. Docker uses this feature of the Linux kernel to separate containers from each other and provide each one with the resources it needs to run without interfering with other containers running on the machine. Now, unlike a VM, which simulates the entire operating system, Docker containers share the kernel for the most important bits of the operating system and only need all the other things they require, like libraries and specific OS binaries, to be simulated. As such, Docker containers end up being much closer to the hardware than VMs which means they usually run faster and they boot up a lot faster. Docker also uses a special file system for the containers and in conjunction with its image system, containers end up using a lot less memory and hard disk space than VMs. So how do images work? Well, at least one image exists for most major software packages out there. For example, there is an image for Python, or an image for Java, or Node.js, or MySQL, or Redis, or Apache, or... you get it. Images are basically stripped-down versions of an operating system, containing exclusively what the specific piece of software needs in order to run properly. Images are published by software vendors on the Docker Hub. Once you have an image, you can run it to create a container. In other words, a container is a running image. Due to the nature of the Docker file system, if you run multiple instances of a certain image, Docker will do its best to not duplicate the pieces of the container which are identical across containers. Limiting memory use and increasing the number of containers which can be run at once in contrast to VMs. Now, you are not stuck with the images provided to you by the Docker Hub. You can use them as starting points for your own custom images, adding any other software you might need as you see fit. Last important step we need to make in order to understand why Docker is becoming so popular is the handling of persistent data. How do you ensure that the product of your process, which ran in a Docker container, 
gets saved after the container finished executing? The answer is volumes. In contrast to VM virtual hard drives, which from the point of view of the host OS are binary files, which cannot be understood directly, Docker went with a different approach for its containers. Folders from the host are mounted to the container as volumes, meaning the container can access the files from those folders and their subfolders, but not any other folders from the host. This provides a degree of isolation whilst ensuring that both container and host can see the same files the same way. There's one more thing which needs to be mentioned, and that is the fact that all Docker images are based around the Linux architecture. Taking this into consideration, you might wonder how Docker works on Windows and Mac OS machines. The answer is quite simple, virtualization. Docker creates a virtualized Linux kernel and OS, and then does all the things we have just talked about in that virtual space. Simple, yet effective. With that, we now have obtained a good grasp of the way Docker works at a low level. Before we move on, let's draw out the main differences between VMs and containers. <laughs>